Go for it. Um, yeah, I, I feel like at my level now, I blunder less, but mm -hmm. more um, inaccuracies. Gotcha. Um, but that's my assumption. Well, Which, I mean, that's that's a good sign. Is that uh, like it's it's better sign if maybe you're getting outplayed or ground down in games. Um, but even then, like like if you can reduce just careless blunders or, or capitalize on your opponent's blunders, sure, um, it can make like even patching small holes can make a, di a big difference in result. Oh, yeah. um, All about that. that Real quick, uh, if you if you do want to see this game where we saw Queen G three, oh, I, I did find it online. I, I'm adding it. Oh, time. okay, cool. I want to. Hey, I'm I'm listening. I'm curious about what that how the rook ended on H three. Yeah, we can just jump to the final moments because okay, it looked like some normal middle game position. Yeah, there's a bishop there. Okay. Um, and then things got a bit crazy. Aha. So rook takes h3 is played. Idea of knight f3 if pawn takes back. Ah, uh, I see. Um, white counterattacked, and Which, this is where queen g3, which is devastating. Yeah, but that actually makes a lot of sense. Like the you know white probably thought a rook c5, like I, you know. Full yeah, at least got the rook out of trouble. Ideas of rook c7 too. Yeah, yeah. That's rook cool. Seven where. So it's a type of move, maybe we'll, we'll get to this later, I'm sure, where it's like uh, one type of invisible move is when you put uh, either minor or major pieces on squares which are attacked by the opponent's pawns. Yeah, and I feel like, oh, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, they're, they're moves which usually a lot of players unconsciously reject. So. Yeah, I, I was gonna say exactly that, like, as I've gone better, I have to consider those as candidate moves, which sure. is a whole other. <laughs> Um, set of calculations, but yeah, I'm excited to see what what you have. Yeah, so um, I have. Oh, actually, wait. Okay, so this is a study on invisible moves. So actually, this example fits well into this study. Let me share the other study with you. Okay. To start with, which is more relevant to blundering. I'll say, like, just from my personal experience, um, when I like play in tournaments, even these days. There's at least a few games where I make like careless blunders. Mm -hmm. Like throughout the tournament, if I play like a nine round tournament, uh, maybe two or three games, there's like kind of a blunder that I wouldn't make if I was in like better mental form. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe it's first useful to identify like what causes, like what are the main causes for blunders, like the underlying causes. Because yeah. sometimes like after, after a tough game or like after you mess up, you can blame it on stupidity, but that's usually not a valid uh, a valid reason. Usually, there there's something a bit more specific, mm -hmm. um, also a bit more like kind of important to identify, so you you kind of know what to fix. Yeah, yeah, sure. Can I guess what it is? So yeah, I mean, we can maybe come up with a list. Like we'll we'll uh, I'll use uh, the study chat. Okay, I'll sure. List off like causes of blunders, and maybe we can go back and forth. Like if you want to start. Yeah, I mean, I have a couple of theories. Like, I feel like, you know, it's, it's like a story in your head where, like, you have control over the position or you're winning. You make an inaccuracy or a mistake and you that tilts you or that frustrates you. The, but the game is still even. But that, that frustration of, like, lack of control causes you to make more mistakes. Yeah, um, I think that's, that's a good reason. That's a bit more... Um... <laughs> a bit more complex, but uh, yeah, la so lack of composure. Oh, are you, are you talking about like not enough sleep? <laughs> yeah, so that's another one, like lack of sleep. So <laughs> lack of sleep, lack of... I'm thinking like psychological. <laughs> composure or, or letting like emotions get the best of you. So if you're able to stay calm, like whether you're winning or you're losing, you'll make, you usually like make less mistakes. Yeah. Um. And there's a few other like obvious ones too, like time trouble is huge. I also feel like you can get cocky when you're like winning. Yeah, I think um, getting cocky or like um, underestimating your opponent. Yeah, yeah. Meaning your opponent or um, overestimating your position, like thinking it's going to be easy and like thinking the game is over before it's over. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
I've done that before. Like, I've done all of these before. <laughs> yeah, I think it's important. To, like, at, like when you do it, you kind of reflect and and figure out like what um, either psychologically you can do differently next time, or like what what sort of habits you can implement so you you avoid these kind of uh, these sins. Mm -hmm. um, there's a few others too um, when it comes to just general calculation, like not seeing the whole board or moving moving too quickly without yeah. calculating deep or deep enough. Yeah. One of my biggest blunders um, that I biggest thing that caused my blunders is like mm -hmm. having you know some complex calculations and then missing the defensive resource they have. And yeah, this, this is actually very big. Is um, miss everything. <laughs> yeah, missing your opponent's resources or ideas. Um, we're going to see a lot of examples of uh, of just failing to to look from the opponent's perspective. Yeah. Um, so this is a good list. I think um, maybe it can it can be added on to, but um, okay. There there's. There's like the chess factors and then also the non-chess factors, of course. Yeah, I'm sure. just getting distracted. Especially, I, I have students who train a lot online and sometimes they, they're making the excuse where like they, they blundered because they were, they were watching TV or they were like not fully focused on the game. If you're gonna play like a serious training game, you wanna be as focused as possible. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of a given, but yeah. <laughs> not watching TV when you <laughs> play <laughs> chess. Okay, so I have a few warm-ups, which are somewhat related to blunders. There's a few stories behind some of these. Um, this is actually, this should be pretty basic position, just an endgame position. Um, black to move. Maybe another, uh, another thing we can list off is um, lack of knowledge in the endgame, where you, like, there's some fundamental endgame position. I, I've seen this before. Yeah? King H6, right? So is black, the question is, can black win? Is it going to be a draw? You're saying king h6. The white spawn is going this way, by the way. Yeah, so king h6, h8, queen, uh, and then king g6. Oh, wait. Yes, right? And question is, is black winning? Um, maybe it is a draw. Because I guess you can block the h8 square or the a8 square. How? Uh, queen h1. Queen h1. Um, queen h1, black is probably going to lose. Yeah. I this see. is not a draw. It's queen and king versus queen and rook. Yeah, OK. I think I did that part. So I was just like being I was just like. I think, yeah, what happened there, you were, you were overconfident thinking you saw this before, <laughs> maybe based on memory. King H6 is actually just terrible. There's a cool, there's a cool move like that though, right? Like I think you, it was in your videos or some, someone where. So there, there is a position I think you're maybe thinking of when Black has a queen. I think I know exactly what you're thinking of. You don't need like, to pull it up or anything, but I, 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 it's something that's out there. So I should have calculated. Probably this, this, right? Where you, you move up white queens and then subs one. Yeah, yeah, that's the move. This is a bit different though, because this is <laughs> like a rook and not a queen. That's fair. If it's a queen, then yeah, well, it's easy win. But I mean, this is an easy draw, but um, I'm curious about if there's a win or not. Mm -hmm. So rather than king h6, which is losing, what's uh, what's a better try for a win? For a win. Yeah. Um, either king g6, king f6. Yeah, let's play out king g6. Yeah, it Pretty seems like a draw both though. So what does white do here? So, oh, oh, I see, the king can't move. I forgot about that. Yeah, we're threatening mate in one. Yeah. Oh, okay, 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 my bad. So, then, so the king, so they can get a knight. Um, right. Then king, I guess you have to play f6. In case of knight f7? Mm-hmm. Um, sure, yeah, king f6 looks very logical. OK. And what's going on? Can white survive? Is white just lost? 
Uh, well, the king only legal move is king f8, and that's a, a yes, one. There's a couple other legal moves too, but not so promising. Yeah, so knight f7, rook takes, knight g6, rook takes. Oh, king takes. King takes. So. Yeah, white's on Zugzong. This is uh, winning. Okay, so. I got too cocky on this. <laughs> yeah. I was like, um, let me put my, I saw this before. <laughs> It's one of these positions sometimes you have to take a step back and look at it with like a fresh eye, just just look through the variations, sift through what's going on. Um, so that was kind of the base, like the starting point. Then we get to this position. Ooh. So the king is one square further away. Question is, let's say you're playing black here, can you can you win? Yeah. So king g5, h1, queen. No, it's this, no, it's the same position as last time, as if it was in king h6, right? Like, yeah. go tempo down. Exactly. So the, the reason I'm showing you this is because I've seen this play out, like, in, in like, a serious game, mm -hmm. where the player, as black, got too cocky, was overconfident, think, thought it was winning. Yeah. Without, first of all, without seeing the whole board, mm -hmm. missing this queen h1 idea. And just not searching for white's resource. Wow. Queen H1 was played, white went on to win the game after <laughs> black thought it was just winning after King G6. Mm. So it's one of these psychological moments, like in this position, you have rook against pawn, you forget about the possibility of, of potentially losing. Mm -hmm. Now on the flip side, if, if we want to go like one level deeper, sure. if you're black in this position and you're, you're, you have this, like let's say in a tournament game, what move would you play? You just take the pawn, no? Taking the pawn would be the simplest option. I would argue the best chance to still try and win is to play king g5. Uh, you play it confidently, knowing that if white queens, you're going to have to just trade. I'll be a draw. But you play this hoping that white doesn't see this queen h1 idea, promotes to knight <gasps> to stop king g6. Oh, I see, I see. So, it's like you're trying to provoke some blunder using this kind of psychological factor. So like in order for white to go into this, white would have to miss this queen h1 idea. Yeah, but, got so, it. You have to make them earn it, you know, earn that draw. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's so the one last chance. Of course, rook takes h7, it should be a draw anyway. But um, it's nice to always know like the big picture and, and identify like your best possibility to, to win the game. Okay, good. Um, one more. Okay. And this next one I actually saw a few days ago was on. So actually, the, those first two I I taught like this chess camp a few weeks ago. I showed this to the campers, but this one I saw just a few days ago on Twitter. Okay. I was trying to find the tweets. I couldn't find it, but it was so similar to the these problems that I've been showing recently, um, where it's uh, it's White's move, Black's going this way. So very similar situation. There's a pawn in G7. Um, this apparently came from a GM game, some like recent tournament. White played rook to A2 check. Black is a grandmaster. Black played terrible, terrible move here. No. So King I guess what I would like you to do is identify the best move to play, but also identify the good looking move, which is just losing. Um. I mean, we gotta stay attached to the G pawn, or else we lose. So it seems like King G three, King H three, King G one, King H one is forced. Wait, sorry, I didn't quite follow there. What, what do you want to play in this position? So, so we have to stay attached to this pawn to the H pawn. That's true. So, oh yeah, so move to one of these squares. Yeah, sure. but these squares are off limits. Yep. Um, I'm just kind of eliminating choices. Um, each one will probably not be the best since it's very counterintuitive yeah yeah so one of these if king g1 will check again and it looks like a draw if we venture off then they'll give that a check and we have to just go back and repeat mm -hmm. um so if we go up 
the king covers these squares, so the best thing to do is just go back down. So it feels like a draw. Regardless of whether you move here or here. Oh, right. so, so what you're saying is not. <laughs> um, yeah, so I will say one of these moves is losing. Ah, uh, okay. Okay, king h1 is losing. These, these moves are losing. But one of these moves are also is also really bad. And it's important, like, if you got into the situation, whether you're white or you're black, okay. to identify which move. Got it. If I were to play it so simple, I'd just go to king g1. Mm -hmm. um, just intuitively. The losing move, I did not calculate king h3. Mm -hmm. Is there a mate somewhere? Uh, I don't see the follow up. I think I'll. I'll give you some guidance here. Okay. Uh, I'll tell you what the Grandmaster played. Okay. So he, he played the same move that you said you he would just play intuitively King G1. No, that's a losing move? This is a losing move. No! So it's, it's very, very similar to the other position we had seen. It's, it's flipped, and there's extra pawn on, on G7. This pawn actually makes a huge difference. Wow. It's detrimental for black. Maybe... maybe and start seeing why. Yeah. Uh, question is why is a pawn on g7 so detrimental to black? Because black has extra moves to do, right? Not necessarily. It's not about like tempo or wasting a move. Oh, so it's something different? But you were drawing the arrows there. So yeah, the, saying, the king's gonna march up, no? Yeah, so let's play that. So h, so king g4. Queen. Queen. And if the pawn wasn't there, what, what could black do? Oh, the same h8 ending. Yeah, but the pawn oh. the diagonal. Wow, so, that's wild. It's like sometimes you, you make some assumption based on something you've seen before, but you don't realize like some small difference in this case, just a pawn in g7. Wow, so king g1 was losing. That's crazy. So king g1 was losing. Uh, king h3 or king g3, just easy draw. Because with either move, you're threatening to queen. White has to move back. There's no like sneaky rook coming behind. It's just drawing. Yeah. My first assumption was that king g1 didn't work because my, my, I, I stopped my calculations. I got a queen, you know? like. Uh, good. Yeah, she never stopped too early. Wow. That's impressive. But I like the foundation you put beforehand, so I kind of get it now. Yeah, once you under, like you understand the simple position, and then like you make one small difference, and then yeah. um, like the kind of the information compounds. So it's kind yeah. of like other situations too. If there's something that you've seen before, but the the position in front of you is slightly different, you have to weigh in the differences and yeah. see how it affects the outcome. Mm -hmm. So um, there's actually another example that. Uh, I'm just re remembering, um, which was, have you been following the U.S. Junior Championship or U.S. Senior Championship at all? <laughs> Unfortunately not. No, okay. I feel like you always ask me if I'm following any chess events. I'm, I'm usually not, sorry. Gotcha. Because there, um, there was a game a few days ago. It was round, oh, what round was it? It was pretty infamous. I'll just show it to you real quick because the, the player made pretty much the same mistake you made. Like he, he thought he was in known territory. He blitzed out a move and then just lost like tragically in the opening. In the opening. Hmm. And it was one of these instances of like playing preparation too quickly. He played kind of the second move in, in, his, in the variation as a first move. So it's, it's kind of like a, a tragic comedy. It's funny for any spectator, or very tragic for the player. Um, what was it? it was this position. Um, okay. All of this was like opening preparation for both sides. Uh, and the game was, um, was renamed. It was Hans Niemann playing White, International Master. Hmm. And I believe International Master Craig Hilby, um, also a strong player playing Black. Um, this position, very simply, the bishops attacked. 
best move is bishop f7. Just defend. In the game, knight b6 was played. And played very quickly, like with, within like 5, 10 seconds. Knight takes e6 is played. Black resigned. Oh, and, just, just a careless blunder. Yeah, it was like so bizarre, but it, it, it goes back to the fact of like being too cocky and, and not um, not seeing the position in front of you, just relying on like something that you think is in your memory. Um, it's kind of a weird situation to describe. Hmm. Um, but it was incredible to watch on the broadcast because like he player playing black just resigned and then like threw his pen like at the table then bounced and like flew across the room it was, uh, <laughs> it was actually really it was an entertaining moment but also <laughs> the player this like 15 year old just like hey chess <laughs> yeah i mean w like when there's so much on the line like so much pressure and you make a blunder like this and like hundreds of people are watching online and so it's pretty <laughs> devastating Oh man, that's funny. Um, but goes to show, like even even top ranked players are not immune to blundering. Yeah, so it happens to an IM. It happens to GMs. Also, I'll see some examples of it. Okay, well, I'm excited to see. So let's move on. Um, a few of these are are a bit more kind of like entertaining examples, but they're also just kind of a wake up sign for uh, just to to be alert at all times. Um, I'll actually, I'll give you this next one as kind of an exercise. Um, this is my, <clears throat> my worst blunder of recent times. And it's a game I played about seven months ago in Australia. Um, it was actually for the tournament that I was preparing for. I think we met. Yeah, I remember I was, you sent me the prep. Yeah, I was in like Malaysia in, at the beginning of December. So this is one of the tournaments I was preparing for. And um, you'll see, I, I was in not the best state. Yeah. Uh, I was white. I was playing against like the lowest rated player in the tournament. And um, he was rated like 2000. And he was putting up a good fight. He played bishop d5 here. And now, now it's white to move. I don't think I want to give so many uh, clues, like beyond what I've already told you. Just white to move. What would you do here? What would you think about? Queen takes g7. Aha, uh -huh. queen takes g7. First instinct. Yeah. Finish five, win the queen. And, uh, I'm going to give you like a minute or two to think. I'm going to get some water. Okay. And uh, feel free to keep, keep thinking. Oh, you can't do that. <laughs> That's funny. It makes me feel slightly better that you also made an assumption at first. Well, that's my intuitive thing, right? Um, right. So I'll, I'll go ahead and just tell you that, like, I, I saw queen takes g7. I didn't really think twice about it. I thought I was winning. I just take, I win the queen back, I'm up a pawn. I play queen takes g7, had to resign the next move. <laughs> it was so, so bad. <laughs> It was against a player who was like, it was an invitational like round robin. It was against a player who was losing to everyone. And he did. It was so embarrassing. Wow. Oh my God. What, what was his reaction when he. When so, he like, I, I played this confidently, and then he didn't make his move right away. He just gave me a look, and then I, I looked at the board and realized, like, oh crap, my knight's pinned. Um, wow. I was so focused on the fork, I just didn't see, like, my knight just can't move. I was tempted to play knight h5 and hope like he wouldn't see my king was attacked, but that would be going a little too far. Yeah, man, that's wild. Um, so this this was a problem for me. I, I thought I honestly thought I was winning, and I didn't realize my position was more difficult than it actually is. It turns out I have to be very precise here. So mm. if I acknowledge queen takes g7 doesn't work, it's still take some work to come up with the right move yeah i mean we have a lot of threat like black has a lot of threats you know right. trying to push trying to do this business i mean how do you stop all of this
Like I feel like I'd be black. I'd rather be black here. Uh huh. Because we're more active. Black black is for the time being having initiative, and yeah, white needs to. So it's a question like you're under pressure. This is a common situation in chess where there's there's threats to deal with. First of all, you have to identify it. Okay, what what's the real threat, and then what are your defensive resources? Like how do you how do you not lose instantly? Okay, so my assumption is the real threat is queen f two. Yeah. If black play gets to play this, it's just force mate basically. Mm -hmm. So how can I defend either the f two square or the g two square mm -hmm. from so far away? And your knight's pinned, so yeah. So the queen has to come back. I mean, this won't work. It's too slow. Taking the pawn is too slow. So oh, it's kind of strange. Do you give up the knight? No. Do you? Mm, no. no. I, if you give up the knight, it's uh, it's pretty yeah. cool. And you're still getting mated. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to just guard the, the f2 square. So uh, maybe I'll, I'll have you think about it in, the, in a different way. Okay. I don't know if this will be easier and more confusing, but um, we'll see. Let's say you allow black to play queen f2. Let's say you get two moves in a row mm -hmm. to save. So obviously not your knight, not your, your king. Like what square could your queen be on so you're not getting made if the queen lands on f2? f1? Sure. Or G2, G1. Okay, well, where else? Let's identify all the squares. Um, so to guard G2, right? To guard G2 or, or just make it so you're not getting mated? Oh, I see. That's the five. Yeah, there's one more square. Oh, one more square. Uh, No. Oh, here. You too, yeah, covered by the knight. So you defend yeah. basically through x-ray vision. So between these squares, um, three of them are realistic to get to in two moves. Yeah, so something like this. Queen d7 or, yeah, queen a6. It's interesting, you rejected queen a6 initially, but you kind of had to use some, um, what do we call this, retrograde thinking. Like You identify the squares first, and then you think how to get there. Yeah, um, I didn't think about getting my queen on e2 because I thought once my um, once the queen is on f2, I I eliminated the the choice that this would be a good like I eliminated anything here because the queen is too fast. Uh, yeah, the X-ray defense it's it's important. Also, the knight helps out defending. Okay, damn, that's that's good for my. I mean, it's good that you're correcting my thinking because. I care less about the answer, but more about like just how how to get there. Yeah, uh, no, it was it was good that like you started. I think by okay, you, you started at the very beginning identifying queen takes g seven, realizing it didn't work, and then going to identify black's threats, identifying the biggest threat is queen f two, mm -hmm. and then looking for ways to try and um, neutralize the threat or just deal with it. Mm -hmm. um, and I've seen like different types of players struggle with different parts of this process. Yeah, and there's a lot of players that just have a hard time identifying the opponent's threat. Like they're so focused on what they want to do, they don't look at their opponent's ideas. Mm -hmm. um, other times, it can be difficult to find your own resources, and sometimes you have to be a bit more creative. Mm -hmm. Like queen, arguably queen d7 is more counterattacking. Actually, you're attacking the bishop and you're threatening queen f5. Mm. Um, and both of these moves, queen a6 or queen d7, lead to approximately equal positions. If we were to play it out, oh, yeah. probably take the pawn on... Oh, no, you can't do that. So bishop e4, we can win this pawn, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, black would probably take on e5, white could play queen f5, trade queens. And it's probably going to be a draw. This pawn should be stopped. Maybe it would take some calculation, actually. D3, what's happening? Uh-oh. Oh, maybe queen f5 is not so good. 
93 and bishop. Yeah, d3, 93, bishop b3. After queen takes e5, white probably has to be a bit more accurate here. Yeah, this is scary, actually. Yeah, because d3 is coming. And queen f5 probably doesn't work. So if d3 is coming, maybe the move to play is queen. Queen a6, yeah. Yeah, maybe queen a6 initially, actually, is simpler. So after bishop d5, queen a6. That way we, we guard d3 and we have queen e2. Yeah. After takes on e5. Then I think we could play queen d3 check. Yeah, it's just blockade. Yeah. And defend the knight, so maybe we can play king d1 soon. And unpin. But yeah, it's a little bit unpleasant for white. Wow, what a game. Oh, I can't, I mean, that, that was, it's so crazy because knowing you, like how, how skilled you are to make a blunder like this, like, um, it, it's kind of like puts you back, it kind of wakes you up a little bit. For oh, for sure. <laughs> I think there were, there were a few different factors which, like, play the role um, between underestimating my opponent because I, I thought he was just he was going to go down without a fight and I was better earlier in the game and then let my advantage slip um, and then also just like time trouble too I, I was below five minutes mm. by, by the time I got to this position and the fact that this was a second tournament in back to back nine round tournaments with no rest days oh and I remember this yeah so it was it was a lot of chess, and I've I've learned my lesson. I've made the commitment to myself. I'm not doing back to back nine round tournaments again because like you should never force yourself to be in a situation where you have to play chess under like kind of uh, strenuous circumstances. Mm -hmm. You should always be in like top physical form if, uh, and mental form if you're gonna play, uh, especially longer games. Yeah. Cool. Um, but yeah, it goes to show, right? like this stuff happens. Um, and sometimes when it happens, it, it's some sort of like therapy to see it happen to other players, um, especially like top players in the world. Um, maybe you saw this, this was part of like the Grand Chess Tour events, or actually it was part of Norway Chess last month. Mm, I have uh, pretty infamous situation. Uh, Grishuk versus Caruana. I'll just show you what happened. It was just a like, hallucination and blind spot. Grishuk played bishop h6 in this position. Is hanging? The queen was defending the bishop. Oh. And Grishuk's like a super GM. Like, yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Well, it's crazy like how, how terrible moves like even strong players can play if they're, if they're not focused. Later, if you want to watch the video, uh, I have it embedded here of like his reaction. It's pretty great. Oh, I'll, I'll watch it later. I was like, I wonder like what he thought, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, he was just like, just shocked. Um, Caruana's like, okay, cool. Yeah, Caruana just like instinctively just took back without like reacting at all. It was great. Um, this another another game came from came from a time scramble situation, actually. Leslie So versus Levon Aronian. Leslie playing black. Um, and like both players had less than 30 seconds with some increments. So maybe I'll, I'll test you. Like, what's your first impression here? If you're playing black, like what move would you play? Just first instinct. Um, uh, I'm in danger. I gotta, I gotta get out of this pickle. I, I'm trying to find White's threat. Time is ticking. I know. I guess White's trying to play Knight of Seven. Mm -hmm. I can't guard that really. Hard to stop. Yeah. So do I move my Knight? No, I can't. I just leave my. I feel like I just leave my rook there. Mm -hmm. So my the rook doesn't get back rank check, mate. Makes sense. Yeah, you don't want to play like your rook f four. Yeah. But at, at this stage, it's just about playing a move which like isn't like blunderous, <laughs> and just keeping the game going. Yeah, like d five or something. Yeah, like d five or e four. 
Um, maybe rook c8 also possible. Like any of these moves, they're just they're keeping the game going in a, t in a time scramble situation. Yeah. Um, the type of moves you just want to unleash quickly, put the ball back in your opponent's court. Mm -hmm. I don't see the threat after knight f7, king g8. Yeah, I mean, white probably wants to like just win the pawn. And like white's down a pawn here. Mm -hmm. White wins back a pawn, and mm, white's probably in the better, but still the fight. The move Wesley so played was knight f5. Mm. Thinking that it's okay, it's defending and trying to simplify white to move. Oh, rook h7. Eight. Yeah. Yeah. I was, it, the commentary was incredible. Um, oh, if you want to, so the Twitch clip, it's not embedded, but it's in the comments. Okay. Um, uh, so you oh, can watch it later. Is that you commentating or like Maurice or someone? Uh, so, it's Span so it's a Spanish commentary for Chess24. It's the most incredible thing I've ever seen in terms of like just chess commentary. <laughs> what? Because they, they comment on it like it's a world championship match, really. Wow. But can you uh, understand them if they're speaking in Spanish? If you, if, you speak, if you understand, like, basic Spanish, you can say it, You can kind of understand they're, like, they're watching the time tick down. And, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> oh, I'm excited. Yeah, I, I just shared it in the, the chat. It's, it's pretty incredible. Okay, well, thank you. Yeah. And like it, it went viral on Twitter. Like I think the clip itself has like well over ten thousand views. Wow! Front page of Chess Reddit. It was great. That's amazing. So, anyway, um, so a lot of these examples are more like blind spots, like missing either certain squares or certain factors in, in the position. Um, I have one more blind spot. This like was moves. another one of my like really tragic blunders. This was from last year most about a year ago. And this is black to move. I was playing black here. I was really trying to grind my opponent down. Um, and maybe it, like at some point, like I, I'll, I was thinking about like showing you a bunch of examples of like the grind down. Where yeah. you have like a slight advantage and you're really trying to just yeah. grind down your opponent. Be also interesting to, to talk about. So for the last like, I don't know, so many like 50 moves this end game this end game started like around yeah like as early as like the early move 20s um wow, what a somehow got like a favorable favorable imbalance two rooks versus a queen this is another position maybe it would be interesting could fit into our, our last lesson of playing out like better end games trying to like to beat the opponent because yeah. black should clearly be better here. Like, the two rooks can team up, start winning pawns. But my opponent put up a lot of resistance. And my problem was that my king was lacking shelter. Like, I wanted to use my rooks to infiltrate. But then my king could be exposed. Uh, it wasn't so easy. F5 yeah. was actually a very good move. Because I, I can't take with pawn e6. And if I take with rook... There were some issues of like checking. We got to this position. I still liked my chances here, but then like my king just never really found shelter. And looking back on it, I think I overestimated my chances. Like it was really not easy. Mm -hmm. If I had to try and win, my king should have probably walked to the queen side, find some shelter there and like try and pick up the pawn. Yeah, well that really in the beginning. <laughs> So not not play g6 in the beginning so that the king yeah. filter. Yeah, there are some other options. Like my idea was to try and like eventually mate the king and work this pawn down the board. Um, as we'll see, I didn't really make progress. I found myself in the situation where and I forgot it's possible to lose this as black. I thought there's okay, I'm playing for two results. It's either gonna be a win or a draw. Um so the question here is like, what should black do? We'll say this is a moment where I blunder. Maybe it would be interesting for you to actually find the move that I played because it looks like a very reasonable move, but it's just you terrible. play rook f g two. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm trying to figure out why it's a blunder. Ah. I don't see it immediately. If you don't see it immediately, I mean, this looks like a very nice move. Yeah, I'm assuming this. You would play too. 
Oh, I see. There's, t- I, there's some way for the rooks to be disconnected, right? Yeah, Queen H8 is just, oh, okay. it was just a blind spot. Like, again, not looking at my opponent's ideas. And That's hard. It was really rough because this game was like over five hours. I, I played it out, like, of course, um, what converted this position. But it lasted over 100 moves. And I worked so hard only to, like, lose the game. It's, like, mentally just devastating. Mm. But then, like, after, after a game like this, like, you, you can't let it affect you too deeply. Like, you just have to brush it off and realize, like, this, this is a, the brutal part of chess. It's, like, it's not like soccer where you score, like, 10 goals and then there's no way the opponent's coming back. Like, one wrong move. And, like, the yeah. whole, whole game switches, uh, switches, like, evaluations. So, wow. um. So yeah, another part of this is like, you, like when, when you lose a game like this, uh, you kind of, you just have to stay mentally strong and move on to the next game and identify what actually went wrong. And for me, it was, uh, it was a mix of different things. Yeah. But like nowadays, like, especially when I played my most recent tournament, when I was getting better positions, I was being very, very careful uh, and just, just staying disciplined to stay extra focused. Mm. I thought I was winning or thought I was close to winning. I, I was staying at the board, not walking around, um, avoiding time trouble. Um, sometimes yeah. it takes that last push of effort, especially against stronger opponents. Yeah. To keep that edge. Yeah. All right, we'll move on. Um, this next one, we actually, I think we looked at last time. Oh, I remember this. This end game. I forget if I told you what happened in this end game. I think I did, though. Um, I don't, oh yeah, you, you, you told me you just, uh, uh, you let go of the B pawn, right? Yeah, I play king e7, all out, knight d3, and then we agree to a draw. It was really bad. Of course, I should identify white's threat, yeah. and then grind it down from there. No, last time we were looking at, like, the idea, I think of eventually playing e4 and then locking the king in, should be good enough to win. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, these next few examples are, are more about like identifying the opponent's ideas. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, this next one is actually, this is a cute one. Um, and this will be, I'll just pose this as a question. Like, what would you do in this position? Like if you're white, Plain white. how would you determine your next move? Uh, my instinct is to just develop my pieces. Mm -hmm. Queen A5 is, could be a thing. Queen A4, yeah. We would say like pick one move that you would, you would choose in this position. Yeah. Um. What's wrong with Queen A4? Queen A4 looks reasonable. Pressure C6. Yeah. And Queen A4, maybe Queen. Queen C7. Seven. You know, you could even just take the bishop. Just get the bishop pair. Yeah, that that's reasonable too. Um, I don't know. Oh okay, yeah, I'm gonna flip the question. What reasonable looking move or moves for White? are just losing on the spot so this is more of a question like yeah what is the potential danger here for white and what what moves do you want to be careful not to play too soon uh, is the danger something with queen d1 checkmate mm-hmm. maybe so the queen is like out of yeah, play so it's important to be aware of the square for sure yeah so how could white blunder here so white can move the queen away from d1 square and the knight away f- blocking the bishop. Right. But can white blunder in like one move? In one move. I'm, I'm trying to find uh-huh. a magic blunder. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you a very bizarre question. What is the worst possible move for white in this position? The worst move? I was thinking like queen b4, um, but it's not that bad. Oh, queen b4 is up there. But queen b4 is just... Yeah. 
Yeah, there, there is a move just as bad as queen b4, which doesn't look that bad at first. So. Let's try to find it, but don't tell me. Okay. What? What's worse than queen b4? <laughs> Actually, queen b4 like gets made in two, right? So it's made in one? So white's next move, not queen b4, allows black to mate in two. Well, it has to be the queen, no? No. Or well, the knight on the e2? Maybe. But wherever the knight goes, the queen always has protection on the d1 square. Okay, I'm gonna help you out then. I'll give you one of the sure. worst moves. Queen okay. four, black to move, made in two. Is made in two here? Yes. It's just oh, not a no, should be four. Before check. Oh, I see. Okay. Source, I thought that at five, but I, I didn't see the bishop before. Yeah, the queen is overworked, just defending too many things. This game uh, came from pretty well known open tournament, the Reykjavik Open, a couple years ago. White was rated over 2,000, black was rated 1,100. That's... Black won this game. Wow. Like he, the guy played knight f4, and like bishop e4 was found and, and mates. That's funny. So that's so tragic. Knight g3 is also losing on the spot. So I think stuff like this, like being aware of yeah. sometimes simple tactics, sometimes more complex tactics from opponents. Yeah, I could easily have played knight g3. Yeah, I mean, it looks so natural, like get your bishop into play. Yeah. Um, I think a strong approach here is to play h3. Interesting. Bishop g4, bishop g2, pressure c6. This is what I would do. Oh, because the knight on e5 is so strong, you don't want to trade it. Yeah, I like this knight. Like, just keep it there. Why yeah. Not? Okay, that, that's very, that's that's very fair. Hmm. So another one of these dynamics where it's like high rate of a player against much lower rate of opponents, where yeah. the high rate player is just like not realizing uh, the opponent's resources. Yeah, your video on this was really good. Um, Losing in like 12 moves, Nakamura. Uh, pros losing really quickly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Nakamura. Yeah, that was, uh, that was a fun one to put together. Should do a part two to that. Just so many games. <laughs> there's a game at... Um, there's actually a game in the, the first round of the U.S. Senior Championship. Okay. Ian lost in 14 moves. Who lost, sorry? Uh, Grandmaster. Okay. Jan Elvis. And he lost, it wasn't really a blunder. Maybe there were some like clear mistakes, but it was more just like devastating attack right from the opening. Mm -hmm. um, I'll have to show you, I'll have to at least include that game because okay, sure. it was, I think it was a line that we discussed at some point in like the modern or the Pirates where like you, you go for this attack early with like Bishop. F3 and H5. Yeah. Or... Yeah, it was nice. Let me give you one more exercise. Okay. Um, Carlson against Wesley So. This My came name. from one of like these Blitz championships on chess.com. Mm -hmm. um, Carlson was playing white. They were playing like a three hour match. So this game, Carlson was getting crushed. It was pawn on d2. Um, pretty menacing. Played king h2. Queen e2 was played with g1. Exercise for you, black to move, what to do. Okay, I'm gonna flip my board. Yeah, go for it. Okay. Okay, I feel like I gotta find out why queen is not right. Looks pretty straightforward. Looks very straightforward. What is- Again, I don't wanna give you like so many clues. Um, it's just like find the best move. Yeah, yeah. Resources. I'm trying to find white's resource after I queen. Yeah, 
Yeah, what is White's resource after a queen? <laughs> so, queen, maybe something with this g2, g7 square. But I don't know, anything is too slow. Right? Oops. Yeah, queen g3, black can defend. Black yeah. can take on g1, right? Oh, that's true. Yeah, I feel like everything's too slow. So, sacrifice. Mm. Is that oh. perpetual? Is it perpetual? Let me see. If you go back down, then it's perpetual. So, you probably have to go up. But that loses, I think. <laughs> right? Um, so, so okay. e one queen, right? Rook takes g7, king takes g7, queen e7. Queen e7. King g6. Queen g6. Queen e3. Queen e6, check. Queen e6, right? Yeah. And if king g7, then it's a draw. I mean, we, we just repeat it. So, king has to go on g5. King g5. And then queen f5 check. Mm -hmm. King h4 only move. Four. And then queen h3 check. Yeah. King g5. G5 and then queen f4. F queen f5. Yeah. Is that it? So that's that's one variation. And that's <laughs> a variation which should make you reject d1 queen. D1 queen allows perpetual. Ah, I see. So once you identify that, then you have to figure out, okay, rook takes g7, it's actually a threat. What to do? So just defend it. Rook g7, yeah. Yeah, or can you, is it possible? No, it's not. I was gonna say to not take the rook back, but it would, that would be suicide, I think. Yes, because queen takes h6 as mate. So it's just queen d7? Just rook d7. Yeah. Rook seven. Man, yeah. you gotta identify that, that threat and see that perpetual. Yeah, it's like sometimes the pawn's threat is uh, it's like finding a tactic, finding like a complex tactic where like usually when it comes to more complex combinations, you're just looking for yourself. But if you're hyper aware of like what's going on from the pawn's perspective, um, it can pay off. Wow. Rook d7 wasn't played. Um, Players were low on time. Wesley Queens, and Carlson took on g7. Wow. It's pretty amazing perpetual. Like two queens and a rook, and the king has no shelter. <laughs> Magnus drew this game. Yes. <laughs> that must be so annoying. <laughs> yeah. No. The the and Magnus was like just crushing Wesley in the match, and this is like the one game Wesley like was close to winning, and it was, um. It, it just it ended in a draw. You could see like both players were recorded on the webcam, and Carlson was just laughing. <laughs> was this recent or a while ago? This was about a year ago. Because um, I, I remember watching like Wesley versus Magnus, and Magnus just crushing, and yeah, Magnus just just laughing the whole time, having fun, and Wesley's like concentrated. <laughs> Yeah, if you want to see the, the clip of it, um, it's on the chess.com article. Okay. In chat. Yeah, I think I might have seen this as an actual thing, but it's cool to see it again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there, there's a lot of like the highlights. So if you scroll down far enough, you'll, uh, you'll see it. Okay. It's I'll good. check it out after, after this. Yeah, it after awesome. Blunder to Perpetual. I'll show the clip itself too. Um, so I have one more related to like identifying opponent's resources. Sure. Um, and this is, this fits into like another study that I think I've, I've had, I don't know if I've shared with you in the past of like good players messing up in end game. Mm, I don't think so, yet, but it could be, yeah, it's like, it's this theme of like a very long drawn out end game. Like the, the one I showed you where I had two rooks against a queen. Where like you play on for so many moves and then you get tired and you're you think you're on the verge of winning. Um but yeah. you're in time trouble. So this is white to move. The question is how can white crack black's position once of course playing for a win up a pawn? 
okay, I feel like the king is very safe here. Mm -hmm. So pushing g5 is a serious committal thing. Mm -hmm. So my, my first instinct is to do what you said last time, is just kind of wait it out. Mm -hmm. so play something like queen f7. Okay. And then wait for the right timing to play. Yeah, I'm trying to get my king here. Mm -hmm. So maybe something like this. I will say this is the wrong approach. Like, if you get this position, you want to be very concrete. And like uh, G G five, I know, I know you want to be patient, but this is like you don't want to reject G five just because it's committal. You want to actually analyze like what happens after G five. You're threatening maiden one. You can't reject <laughs> a move after just glancing at it. like it's a pawn move. Pawns don't move backwards, of course. But um, you're threatening maiden one. You have to look further, right? Yeah, I think I was just scared. Wow. Yeah, so this is, I think this is a, a common issue. Um, I've had this issue before, I still sometimes have it, where I don't want to commit, I want to be patient. But if there's a concrete approach and it's forcing and it works, okay. I want to be able to calculate. So, so, in this case, so in this case, let's calculate G5, I guess. So What does black do to stop mate? Um, he either take or play g6, but g6 loses, so mm -hmm. h takes g6, or um, h takes, wow, so black has no checks. Mm -hmm. So what does black do here? I'm threatening just mate in one. Right. So black is stuck here. It's over. G5 wins on the spot. Whoa. I rejected that immediately. That's yeah, it's, it's actually kind of eye-opening. Wow. Uh, That's my problem. Yeah, we've looked at a lot of other examples where, yeah, you want to be patient and not commit so early. But yeah, yeah. this question is just like, you know, you've got to hunker down, force yourself to calculate. And this is forced me. Well, I, I had a, well, I had a lot of bias because last lesson was all about being patient. Yeah, you know, like the quiet move. Being your opponent don't have many good moves, so just improve your position slowly. And so yeah, different situations call for different things. And in this situation, like your king is safe, you, you have the the opportunity to just to strike. Hmm. Um. Now the reason why I'm showing this to you, G5 was not played in the game. Ah. F6 was played in the game. F6. Which also, I mean, it looks like a nice striking move, trying to like remove this pawn, get in some check, win the H pawn. Mm -hmm. um, so here we see a, a move which maybe looks good at first, but actually turns out to be a terrible, terrible blunder. Now we have to identify what can black do. Black to move and win. Just give a check. How? Uh... I'm assuming queen c5. Ooh, queen c5, g5. Yeah, I'm, so this is probably what was calculated like during the game. Uh, oh, Curtis, I see. Queen, white. queen b5. Well, there's a queen on on e8, controlling oh. both of these squares, right? Oh, I knew that. <laughs> um, More division. Okay, so say queen c5, g5. Oh, wait, no. Wait, black wins? Black to move and win, yeah. Wow. <gasps> no way. Way. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it's like one of these very bizarre like queen sacrifices. So you've been working on queen sacrifices, seems like. It, it, it has been in the last week, so it's just very timely. I'm not actually this good at that. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's more about like recognizing this king is, is potentially in danger. And f6 allows such a beautiful concept. Wow, oh, that's, that's really pretty. When the queen, and the game ended, yeah, queen takes b5. So black won. <laughs> One just terrible move, F6. 
<laughs> chess is brutal. It's so brutal. Like you and she were like she played such a beautiful game to lead up to this point. It was just a, such a nice end game grind down. If it didn't, if the game didn't end like like this, maybe it would be good to include in like some compilation <laughs> of like games where an opponent is ground down. But here it's just such a tragic. tragic yeah. So. Yeah. So like, okay, the stuff happens, and like the thing you want to do is is minimize it as much as possible. Sometimes you just have to, to open your eyes to what the opponent might be searching searching yeah. for. Yeah, very fair. Wow, this is really good. I'm surprised you did all this in like a day. Right, right. I, and I, I know we're we're not getting to all of the examples, but there are a few more, a uh, few more things that you're you're more than welcome to take a look at. Okay, we can go over it next time too. Yeah, sure. Yeah, a few a few of the ones that we didn't get to involve like resigning prematurely, like resigning in the position which looks lost. It actually isn't lost. Oh, I see. Um, and that's probably, in my opinion, that's probably one of the worst mistakes you can make in chess. Yeah, you're the one who, who never resigns, right? Yeah, I've, I've maybe made that or built that into my brand of like playing on even like very bad positions, um, but pulling some miracles. Yeah. Okay, we can do that, and we also do the quiet move stuff uh, after next time. Sounds good. Yeah, um, I'll. Yeah, I mean, you have both studies, so feel free if you do you want to look ahead and, and test yourself. You're more than welcome to. Sure, I want to look at the clip where Magnus wins. <laughs> yeah, fun. yeah, and then there's a few other clips like the Spanish commentary.